if further identification were required of the beast than that of what was discussed in the last video, then verse 18 of Revelation chapter 13 provides it. Here is wisdom. He that hath understanding. Let him count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is. 660 and 6. There is perfect correspondence between this man and Paul's man of sin, who opposes and exalteth himself against all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. As the centuries progressed, the popes took on grander and grander style, setting themselves up as vicar of Christ or Christ on earth. Permitting the use of blasphemous titles such as Our Lord God the Pope and accepting the homage of clergy and laity in gorgeous ceremonies. The title, Lord God the Pope, is found within a gloss of extravagance of Pope John 22, Title 14, Chapter 4, from 1317 to 1320. In an Antwerp edition of the extravagance, the words, Dominum Deum, Nostrum Papam, Our Lord God the Pope, can be found in column 153. In a Paris edition, they are found in column 140. 6. In Bible symbology, is the number of man, and the number 666 conveys the idea of a totally man-centered system. As indeed is the papacy, a resurrection of the sixth head. What is interesting about verse 18, as just stated, is that there appear to be two indicators as to what the beast is, that being one, a number that can be counted or calculated, and two, that it is the number of a man. Let's first take the number 666, as written in all modern English translations of the Bible, and which is the numerical equivalent of the three Greek symbols written by John in the original Greek texts, being key, z, and stigma. As shown in the earliest manuscripts, the Beza Greek New Testament of 1598, Stephanus Textus Receptus from 1550 and 1894, as well as the Tischendorf 8th edition, and Greek Orthodox Church 1904 manuscripts. Key, Z, and Stigma, has Strong's reference G5516, and is translated into English as CHXS, and has the definition of abbreviation for 666. Irenaeus, who was only one generation removed from the Apostle John, wrote. The name Latinus, Latindum, contains the number of 666. And it is very likely, because the last kingdom is so called. For they are Latins who now reign. Irenaeus was referring to the numerical equivalent, that is the letters of the Greek alphabet, having numerical values of the word as follows. L, 30. A, 1. T, 300. E, 5. I, 10. N, 50. O, 70. S, 200. Total, 666. Latinus is a highly appropriate word to designate the beast empire founded by the papacy. Not only was the west of the old empire regarded as Latin, while the east was referred to as Greek, but the Roman pontiffs dropped the use of Greek, despite its being the language of the New Testament, and made Latin the official tongue of the church. The Christendom of history is truly more accurately designated Latindom, making it the identification of the beast of the sea. It is of interest to note that the phrase, the Latin kingdom, he Latin Basileia, also has a numerical equivalent of 666. This sense of the Latin Kingdom is still strong today, with an article titled, Poland's Government is Leading a Catholic Revival, by Eric Campbell, on 28th of April 2020, on news site abc.com.au. When he asked the leader of the Law and Justice Party, Robert Bakuwicz, what Catholic values he would like enshrined in law. All Catholic values, he says. They are founded on what we can call the greatest and the most wonderful and beautiful civilization that ever existed on earth. I mean Latin civilization. Now, looking into the rest of verse 18, where it states, for it is the number of a man, and looking closer at the actual symbols written by John in the Greek text being, key, z, and stigma. 
these symbols, in later translations of the Greek texts, were changed to the words for 600, hexacosiae, 60, hexconta and 6, hex. But there is no denying that John did not originally write the words for 600, 60 and 6, but the three symbols key, z, and stigma. And these symbols can actually be found, quite clearly, in images of Christ from the early papal period onward, used by the Catholic Church as abbreviations of Jesus Christ. X and C, with the middle stigma sign placed on top. Apparently as a sign, that the name is holy. The English name Jesus itself, derives from the late Latin name Isis, the Hebrew name recorded in the Bible for the Jewish Messiah, in the Greek New Testament is Jesus, and in the Old Testament Hebrew it is Yetua. The English translation of Jesus did not appear in Bibles until 1611, when J was introduced, and the name Jesus replaced the original translation of Jesus, though a more accurate translation of both Yeshua and Jesus, into modern English today, is Joshua. The beast of the sea, can thus be recognized as the Latin-centered kingdom of Catholic Christendom, lifting up a different messiah and different Jesus who from this point on I will be referring to, by the original Hebrew name of Yeshua, so it is clear to whom I'm talking about, the false Jesus of Christian tradition, or the Messiah Yeshua, of all mankind. With regard to the composition of the beast of the sea, the appropriateness of the animal symbology must be admitted. The religion of pagan Rome, and of corrupt Christianity, owed much to Greek, Persian and Babylonian sources. The basic element in the beast was the leopard body and the connection of the leopard with ancient pagan religious ritual is well established. The lion mouth is remarkably connected to the popes who have acted as spokesmen for the church. In all the many names taken by the popes down to the present time, only one animal is represented. Leo, the lion, has been selected 13 times. Before moving on from chapter 13 of Revelation, to review the history of the warfare conducted by the beast of the sea, another beast, and also an image must be considered. And I saw another beast, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns, like unto a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the authority, of the first beast in his sight, and he maketh the earth, and them that dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose death stroke was healed. And he doeth great signs, that he should even make fire, to come down out of heaven, upon the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them, that dwell on the earth, by reason of the signs which it was given him to do, in the sight of the beast, saying to them, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of the beast, who hath the stroke of the sword, and lived. And it was given unto him, to give breath to it, even to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as should not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free and the bond, that there be given them a mark on their right hand, or upon their forehead, and that no man should be able, to buy, or to sell, save he that hath a mark, even the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The lamb horned beast of the earth, speaks like a dragon, and, in fact, takes over the role of the Greco-Roman dragon, in promoting the interests of the imperial Catholic beast, the beast of the sea. By signs of fire, he deceives men and causes them to worship the Catholic beast, and to make an image of it, which could live and speak. He also places the mark of the Catholic beast, on all ranks of men, without which they are unable to buy, or sell. The fulfillment occurred in the exploits of Charlemagne and his successors. As we have seen, the imperial dragon in Constantinople in the east, once having established the papacy, became less and less able to support it. As a matter of necessity, the popes turned westward to the Franks to perform the supporting dragon function, which, after some initial tardiness, they did with enthusiasm. They had already rendered a service to the church when, under Charles Martel in 732 AD, they had turned back the Muslim invasion of Europe. Now, Charles the Great, with a series of aggressive wars, established a Frankish Empire, whose territory eventually approximated modern France, Belgium, Netherlands, West Germany, Czechoslovakia, Austria, North Italy, Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Sardinia. 
Charles had visions of a restored Roman Empire, with the one Catholic religion emanating from St. Peter's in Rome. Pope Leo III unexpectedly crowned him, probably with his concurrence, as emperor, to the popular acclamation of the assembly. On that very and most holy day of Christmas, when the king, at mass before the confessio of the blessed Peter the Apostle, was rising from prayer, Leo the Pope put the crown on his head, and acclamation was made by all the people of the Romans. To Charles, Augustus, crowned by God, great and pacific emperor of the Romans. Life and victory. And after the praises, he was adored by the apostolic in the manner of ancient princes, and, discarding the name of patrician, he was called Emperor and Augustus. Whatever the motives behind the incident, the effect was to create out of the European earth, not from Mediterranean sea-based people, a new beast empire, with a religious basis, a beast of the earth with two horns like a lamb. The two horns were the emperor and the pope, the first to defend the faith on behalf of the second, the second to maintain the people's fidelity to the first, and all for the benefit of both. Although the new empire would produce conflicts of interest between the two horns, the overall result was to bolster the fortunes of the church sea beast. In medieval Europe, Catholic baptism, later changed to sprinkling, and the sign of the cross, constituting the mark of the beast, were to be the indispensable requirements for buying and selling, and the general business of life. Jews and protesting Christians were to be subject to the most ghastly tortures, as means of inducement, to worship the beast and his image. The image of the sea beast, created at the instigation of the beast of the earth, must logically be a physical representation of the spiritual church empire, where the pope reigned as both priest and king. The popes had aspired to this since the days of Gregory I, and it was the work of the Franks with the dragonish fire of war to neutralize the lumbered threat and place the states of the church under the direct temporal rule of the pontiffs. This visible image of the spiritual empire was given the breath of life in the underwriting of papal power by the Frankish emperor. Within the papal territory, the ecclesiastical princes reigned after the example of the pagan Caesar divines of pre-Constantinian days, although on a much smaller scale. In many Christian churches today, it is taught that the image of the beast that can speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed would be some kind of future statue or stone idol or a technological wonder. But this would contradict the rest of the Bible that clearly states that idols made of man are not living, speaking objects and hold no power in themselves. As stated in Psalms, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Therefore, the image of the beast should thus be seen as an ideology or governing system as explained. By 888 AD, the Frankish Empire had divided into separate kingdoms, illustrating the brittle iron and clay consistency represented in the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Less than 100 years later, the function performed by Charles the Great had been taken over by the Germans, who annexed the north of Italy and formed an empire from the Baltic and the North Seas to the Papal States in the south. The Emperor of Austro-Germany and the Pope became the Lamb Horns of the Earth Beast, which became popularly known as the Holy Roman Empire, and which lasted till the time of Napoleon in the early 1800s, albeit not without many alterations. The image of the sea beast shrank to the dimensions of the Vatican City State in 1870. This brings to conclusion this playlist, which has brought us from the political earthquake of Constantine's day, when Rome began to embrace Christianity, to the completed reorientation of the Kingdom of Men in 800 AD, an arrangement that was to last, with the exception of the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, for almost 1000 years. The overwhelming impression conveyed by these developments is that Rome survived and conquered. She had previously destroyed the Jewish state. She had now destroyed, so far as the mass of mankind was concerned, the gospel of the kingdom preached by the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua, and the early Hebrew Christians, not by frontal attack, but by engulfment. She had survived the attacks of barbarians, and, in turn, had conquered them with Roman Catholicism. 
she had held out against the Muslims. In the most important departments, Rome lived on as strong as ever. In prestige. In ideology. In superstition. In human aspirations. And in an ever widening field of national influences. She was now physically represented in the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople, the second Rome. In a federation of kingdoms in Western and Central Europe. And in a system of churches spread even further afield, extending from the British Isles to Africa and the Middle East. But this Roman institution, which boasted of nobleness, was guilty of the basest of crimes. She had accused and despised the Jews as God-killers, yet had taken the purest teaching of the merciful, righteous and resurrected Yesha, and corrupted it with the grossest superstition and idolatry. And not content, she was to add to her crimes the blood of those within her sphere, who would not fornicate with her in her sorceries and blasphemies, the blood of Jews and protesters against the corrupted church, and the cry of desolate Jerusalem. Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold, and see if there be any sorrow, like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me. None of this had not excited Rome's pity, indeed. The sad lot of Zion's children would appear to have provided justification for Rome to help forward their affliction. As spoken in Zechariah. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem, and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, my house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Thank you for watching, subscribe to get notifications of new videos, like, share and comment below.